have a few moments of silence, if we could, please, if we could bow our heads.
uh, this might be a question for Mrs. Mr. Messick, but um, I, I'm not quite sure where we wouldn't be in violation of other lights uh, across the town where we have street lights. Um, so, uh, you know, again, uh, the, the assertion that we, the staff and, and even on occasion board members have to try to work with Ms. Ms. Curtis on this, I think is not accurate. Uh, we've staff over the, over the last year or so has, has definitely put in its due diligence to help and uh, we, we could continue to do that, but um, uh, according to Duke Energy, they're, uh, they're pretty much at a loss as well as far as what lower wattage light we could put in next to our house. And, uh, uh, you know, as far as the lights that are 150 feet or so away, I'm also at a loss to figure out what we can do about those. The chief will take it on day five, too. So, as always. Yeah, thank you, sir. And um, I, when I was here at the last meeting, I did provide a printout and a CD to all of you mm -hmm. with the uh, chronological email between me and Mr. Grusick, or lack thereof, and the rest of the town. So I just want to make sure that y'all did get we it. We do have it. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. So Thank you. what would be my next? Uh, Mr. Grusick will continue to review. And also, Mr. Met and Mr. Messick hopefully will weigh in on that as well, uh, because according to him, we're, we are in compliance. So basically, that would be a decision or a determination that our attorney would make. And it's very helpful to look at streetlights at night. It doesn't look like there's a problem in the daytime, but getting someone at night to look at them is very difficult. Okay. Thank you. We have no one else signed up for our public expression, so we're going to go forward with the public hearing. If we could, please. We need a motion to go into public hearing. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Mr. Do you want um, the chief to time? Do the time to three minutes? Absolutely. Okay. Uh, let me just remind everyone the time is limited to three minutes, and our chief will be indicating that. So basically, public expression again is limited to three minutes for uh, Chatham Park as well as our city. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Bowen, this is a, a map amendment to the town zoning ordinance uh, for approximately 7,000 acres of land owned by Chatham Park investors, uh, together with the master plan required under their ordinance for a planned development district. Uh, since you all uh, redid the text amendment to the ordinance a short while ago, creating the, the planned development district, this is a, the map amendment that is consistent with that and follows along uh, in that same path. This is the identical. Um, map amendment and text uh, that was approved by the town in December of 2014. Uh, the additional elements that are required to be uh, uh, submitted under the master plan are still due in December of 2016 as was approved back in December of last year. Uh, so basically this is the same thing you did in December uh, except for that one change. Okay. Thank you, sir. We have several individuals signed up for a public hearing, but let's begin. Mr. Mentic has given us the overview, so let's begin with uh, Mr. Peter Face. And if you would kindly state your name and address for the record, please. Sure. My name is Peter Fye. I'm sorry. No, it's fine. Mm -hmm. I uh, live at 1065 Booth Hill Road, which is off Lister Road. Uh, this is the third time this plan has come up before you guys. And uh, it's a little embarrassing. And you kind of wonder where the professionals are in this room when you can't get it right. And the only reason this is happening is because of Pittsburgh Matters and their lawsuit that's bringing this, forcing you to try to do it right. However, it's still not right. It's still not a plan. It's a joke. 
and it's a joke to call it a master plan. And I'm wondering where your motivations are that you approve these jokes. Michael, I understand yours. It's not unlike the motivation of a member of our board that's no longer a member of the board anymore. Um, you know, so I can't change your mind. Pamela, I think your heart's in the right spot. I think you're interested in, in jobs for the county, at least that's what I've heard. But you know, I'm an electrical contractor. I work just for general contractors. Half the general contractors I work for live in this county. I've never worked in Briar Chapel. I did a service call, but I've never done a job here. I've never worked in Westfall. I've never worked in the Legacy. I've never worked in Chapel Ridge. These are track builders. They don't provide jobs for people in the county. And hell, the dump truck drivers don't even come from Chatham County. And the greater grading contractors for 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 this for this monstrosity won't be coming from Chatham County because we don't have a large enough grading contractor. We don't have a plumbing supply house in the county. We don't have an electrical supply house in the county. Not one stick of wood will come from a county lumber yard. So we're not going to get any tax benefit. And yet, the way this plan reads is we're going to be paying for the schools because they're not providing land. They're not going to pay for the school. Bar Chapel gave Chapman County a bunch of, you know, flood, you know, you know, some crappy land right on the edge of the thing for Wood School and for Margaret College School. But it wasn't any big deal, and they got the tax advantage at a higher rate. They didn't cost, didn't cost, they made money on the job, and the people in Chatham County keep having to pay for things. So you need to rethink your motivation about providing jobs for the county and what it's going to cost us. And Mr. Farrell, I don't know you, but I think I probably have worked with people that you know. Uh, and I think most of the people I've worked with that you know would support your view. Would support what you're, you know, you're allowing to, you know, you're supporting this. But I think you need to think bigger than, than them because they're, you're going to be, they're going to be paying property taxes. Their property taxes are going to be paying for the schools and the infrastructure needed for this monstrosity. And we're not, you're not asking for it in the planning stage. You need to get it now, not later. If you're, and, and so you're. You have to think out of the box a little bit. Three minutes. So, anyways, I appreciate your service uh, for most of the board, and thanks so much. Thank you, sir. Uh, next, we'll have Mr. Tim Smith. Uh, thank you. I'm here to tell you some of the things that we have going on at Chatham Park that you may not be aware of. Uh, I apologize for having to go through this public hearing again, but it's a alleged glitch in the ordinance uh, approval, and that's why we're having to go back through it. So I apologize for you having to sit here through all this for the, about the fifth time for that. As you're aware, the zoning was set up so that we could come back at a later time with our small area plans, hire consultants to help us formulate our small area plans. We will be coming back with those area plans in August. So our first small area plan will come in August. It will consist of everything north of Old 64, about a third of our acreage. We have over 37 consultants, some of them world-known consultants working on these plans. I just want to tell you some of the things that we have going on. Water, we presented to you a water plan a month and a half ago that you gave us the nod on. We're, all, we're under design with that water system now the pipelines, the pumping stations, and two water tanks, a 300,000 gallon water tank and a million gallon water tank. Sewer, we presented you with a sewer plan three months ago. We were under design with the sewer and a water reclamation plant of 500,000 gallons. That's under design now. We have hired Kimberly Horn for traffic engineering. They have done a traffic analysis of the entire project and of the area that's going to consist of a small area plan, so that will be submitted to you in August. Schools. We have a school plan which shows nine schools. We have submitted that to Chatham County School Board, have met with them and their consultants that's doing a study for the schools. It will consist of nine school sites that we set aside for the county. In addition, we will have private uh, and charter schools. I'm happy to announce that we have a commitment for a private school. It will be K through high school and it will be built for 950 students and it will be open two years from this August. It will be open for 950 students. Uh, our, all of our open space has been delineated. 
With over 700 acres of parkland, our project will have over 30% open space that we have stated before. All stream buffers, steep slopes, and wetlands are delineated and will be shown in two months in August. We studied ways to minimize impacts to our drinking water by using reuse water. Our water reclamation plant, which is basically a sewer plant, will provide irrigation water and water to send back to the town's water plant. Now the town water plant can accept 20% of its makeup water from a sewer plant. We have individual extra buffers, increased extra buffers on the Hall River, the lake, and Robeson's Creek. We've done an economic impact study, which you may have seen, which determines the tax revenues for the county and the town. We have also done an impact study on job creation. We have studies and plans for trails and parks that are almost complete. Bridge over US 64 will be completed in four months. In addition, we are meeting with DOT about making all of our stream crossings bridges to minimize stream impacts. Also, we have eliminated numerous stream crossings that were shown on the town's thoroughfare plan. We are working with the town on a facilities plan. We have opened a downtown office. Also, our engineers and our architects have opened a downtown office since that time. We have joined with the downtown business owners and obtaining from NCDOT over $1.3 in a first phase redevelopment plan for downtown. We paid for the initial studies, which was over $50,000 to do that. We have wanted to obtain a commitment for a high-speed internet for Pittsburgh. We now have that. We have paid up to $150,000 or our $300,000 commitment to the town, which the town has already hired employees. In addition, we have locked down a solar farm, hospital YMCA. We have also done a compass committee, which met last Tuesday. Thank you. Commissioner, I'd like to apologize too. I accidentally hit a button, so I had to approximate on that one. Okay. Thank you. I screwed up. I zigged when I should have zagged. <laughs> <laughs> More time? No, we can. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Uh, next, we have Mr. George. And please forgive me if I mispronounce your name. It's okay. Corwitz. Oh, George Corwitz. Ken Bynum Beach Road. I've lived there 43 years. I had the good fortune to be raised by an educated and open-minded family, and I was taught from an early age that most, but not all, politicians were scoundrels or worse. I grew up with the useless notion that the residents were above politics. On the other hand, I was taught that we had representative government. I'm not obliged to laugh even if it's funny. I didn't notice that local businesses were being squeezed out by junk hucksters in their big box stores. But I hadn't the brain to see it but end with the elimination of much, I hold dear, the mammoth sunset, the starry nights, owls and critics, crickets, quiet mornings, lazy afternoons, the sound of the river switching over the rocks below my house. The hall is certainly the most interesting neighbor I had, although the crows and humans and snakes and turtles are delightful too. I have yet to meet a Pittsburgh native who wants anything to do with Chatham Park. Maybe tonight I'll get lucky. I will point out, as I have done before, that this is the board's opportunity to respond to the wants and needs of their constituents. I doubt you'll take that opportunity seriously. Most likely you'll go on rubber stamping the dictates of the developers. You know, trees, phantom stores, 50,000 people from God knows where. What the hell do you care about us? So instead of trying to reason with the board, I ask my friends and neighbors, I speak to my friends and neighbors gathered here this evening. Each of you knows five people who did not vote in the last election. I ask each of you to identify those sweethearts, speak to them, tell them you understand, then point out to them that they could have helped to avoid this catastrophe, then ask them to inform themselves better and help them at the time. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Kelly? Uh, Ms. Kelly, please excuse me. The name like Duck. <laughs> My name is Dr. Kelly. I live at 735 Russet Run. I don't really have a lot planned on what to say here. I'm just sort of coming from my head and my heart, <clears throat> which is I've got a little five-acre horse farm that I've been living at for about 17 years, which adjoins what will be mixed-use 
Um, all of the land next to me, when I purchased that land, sort of for my lifetime home, was uh, zoned rural residential two acre. Now it's mixed use. I guess one of the biggest things that I would ask is to implore the people that are putting this together to at least have some sort of neighborly attempts to let us know what you're going to put next to us. You know, what kind of impact this is going to have on my life, on my horses. You know, am I going to have a big box store next to me? Is it going to be a huge parking lot? Um, originally, when that land was going through rezoning, when Ricky Spoon was doing it, who at least at that time I had a name and a face to go to. I had a phone number. I could talk to him. And, and Ricky would listen. You know, we had different vantage points, but he would listen. I could call him up and say, hey, where's the key to, you know, ride my horse through the gate at Bynum? And he'd tell me where the key was, and I called him on horseback for that, you know? Can I ride my dirt bike on your land? Yes, he was cool about it. But I feel like I don't exist, I don't matter in what's happening all surrounding my land. And when I see on the master plan map, you know, a dit dash across the private road that I live on, and so that's going to be incorporated into it. I just think that it would really be nice to speak with your neighbors about what you're planning to do to their lives and the impact that you're planning on having on their lives. You know, I'm living through the noise and the dirt and the construction going on with the UNC building. I don't know what the next plot of land that's been totally clear cut is. I think it's part of the water collection system from all of the wastewater that's going to be created by it. I, I'm just not sure, but it would be nice to at least be recognized as a human being, as a landowner, and as somebody who actually matters. Maybe not to you, but to me. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Mike Watkins. Mike Watkins, 400 Prince Creek. From the beginning, I've struggled to figure out why this bull can vote on Chatham Park the way you do. You're intelligent, dedicated folk. It defies logic that you would perpetually roll over and accept the word of, de of a developer that trust us, all will be well. I can only come up with four reasons. One, you don't understand it. Two, some peer pressure or duress is preventing you from speaking out. Three, your negotiations are secret and therefore illegal. Four, you expect some kind of reward, willing to sacrifice the respect for your constituency and neighbours for greasing the path of this insidious land speculator. Clearly others may see different possibilities. As predicted, Chatham Park now openly admits they have few plans to build anything but infrastructure, mainly roads at that. Those vaunted jobs are not coming from anything Chatham Park are going to do. Not 22,000 dwelling units, nor 20 million commercial square feet, at least not from Chatham Park. Where's that billion dollar tax base when there's only roads to tax? Remember that amazing economic impact study? Assiduously promoted by our EDC, now shown for the shameless hype it already always was. When I called Michael Walden at NC State, he hastily denied any responsibility for those results, adamantly asserting it contained no research whatsoever and was nothing more than a best case model of CBI's own totally non-validated data. You know that now the Chatham Park speculators will offer this land to any and every developer eager to exploit a regulation-free PDD handed this, which this board handed to them without question or due diligence. To many in the Eastern ETJ, the legacy of this board is already the wanton destruction of their life plans, aspirations for their property and quality of life. The legacy I assume you could talk on a well-structured, vibrant communities, economic prosperity, a model for the world to admire, clearly has already evaporated. 
What's left is only as the board that failed to stop Chatham Park and the destruction of an entire region not to mention a beautiful town, its character, and its soul. You still have this opportunity to convert a potential legacy of apparent apathy and greed to one of thoughtful, considered action. Put a hold on their infrastructure rollout, put some real safeguards into the master plan before they're released to commit land rape yet again. But you want my guess? You'll phone to Chatham Park speculators and to Commissioner Fioco we will ultimately come to understand the best in this world. Thank you, Mr. Wyatt. <laughs> Mr. Turner-Witted. I'm Turner-Witted, I live at 3440 Hanks Chapel Road. For the last several months, or actually tens of months, we have gathered to hear presentations by Chatham Park investors and responsive comments by members of the Pittsburgh community. Chad Park has presented a parade of award-winning designers promising a new town of exceptional quality. And the community has responded with cautious skepticism and continued requests to see a plan. The contribution of the Southwest Shores Assessment, a well-researched report, was acknowledged and then immediately dismissed by Chad Park. Community sentiment was summarized by the Lawrence Group town's own expert consultant. Stated simply, the Lawrence Flute Group politely pointed out that the emperor has no plan. The nearly unanimous voice of this community has continued to request a written and substantive plan from Chatham Park investors. CPI has continued to respond with a vacuous legal document improperly labeled a master plan that provides no meaningful description of proposed development and a majority of the Pittsburgh Board of Commissioners has continued to approve this flawed document in its numerous corrected versions. This sequence of events has turned the community's attention to the approval process itself. Why have four members of this elected body continued to write a blank check to CPI in spite of the community's request for a voice in the process? In one case, the dubious banner of economic development has been raised. Others have hidden behind the barrier of small area plan approval, ignoring the irreversible elements of the developer's so-called master plan. But for the most part, there has been no reason given by the commissioners for their vote. To the citizens of the Pittsburgh community, this constitutes failure. It is a failure to respect the surrounding environment. It is a failure to publicly examine the physical viability of traffic, wastewater disposal, and public services. But most of all, it's a failure to represent the citizens of this community. We must all acknowledge the immense commitment of time that commissioners have made in serving this community. We acknowledge the challenge of evaluating all matters that come before the board. But in this specific case, we must acknowledge failure. Thank you. We next have Ms. Amanda Robertson. I'm sorry, Ms. Amanda Robertson. I'm Amanda Robertson. I live at 244 Prince Creek here in Pittsburgh. I'll be speaking tonight first for myself and then on behalf of Pittsburgh Matters. First, I'd like to personally thank Mayor Bill Terry, who is in here tonight, and Commissioner Beth Foley for your honest representation of the citizens of Pittsburgh regarding our concerns and the approval of the various and nearly identical Chatham Park Master Plans over the course of the last year and a half. It is clear to me that you have heard us, all of us, each and every time when you voted down approval of this plan and advocated for improving the protections of our community before moving forward. Thank you. Thank you for your past service and I hope for your continued service. Mr. Farrell, Ms. Baldwin, Ms. Turner, and Mr. Fioco. In this Chatham Park issue, we have seen in you an utter abandonment of the responsibility of representation of the public for which you were each elected. Is this due to ignorance, arrogance, or just indifference? Or perhaps there is monetary gain to be made. 
I don't know. Except for this last one, that of monetary gain, which would be illegal, it really doesn't matter. You are representing the public. There is truly no greater wrong in politics than to so blatantly ignore the public that you were elected to represent. Now, Pittsburgh Matters comments. I'm speaking tonight on behalf of Pittsburgh Matters, a nonprofit grassroots organization founded by local citizens interested in protecting our way of life, our culture, our community, our environment. As we, Pittsburgh Matters, including our over 600 constituents, have been asking you for nearly two years, we demand from you a better plan for our town and our community. Period. We will not settle for less. We will not. This is our town. This is our community, and it matters to us. Pittsburgh matters. It used to be that we would get up here respectfully, believing that Pittsburgh mattered to you too. It is clear that this is most definitely not the case because the citizens are Pittsburgh, the people, and we have been very, very clear with you about how we want this plan to go, and you have ignored us. Yet you have again, thanks to Pittsburgh Matters and the 600 plus citizens that make up Pittsburgh Matters, you have another opportunity to get this right. And by now, after two years, you should not have any excuse to say you didn't know what the public wanted you to do to improve this plan. So here we are to ask you yet again to get it right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Robertson. <laughs> Next we have former Mayor Ray DeGoler. Thank you, Madam uh, Mayor Pro Tem. I'm just here to offer a perspective, not from me, but from the Budget and Tax Center in Raleigh, so that we can put this on the record. There's been an awful lot of things put on record about economics, but I think people should have a good idea of an economic snapshot of the county we live in, and that this should go to the record. So if my time is cut short, I'll just submit this brief for the public record. Chatham County is a tier three county and has a population approximately now of 69,853 people. This is before we start with Chatham Park, before another development is done, before anything else happens. Chatham County's unemployment rate was 4.8% in January 2015, down 4.9% from January 2014. There are 950 less employed people in Chatham County today than there were in 2007. 31,743 workers were part of the county's labor force in January 2015. This is a 6.2% change since January 2014. Poverty. 15.6% of the county's residents, 10,308 people, so you are likely to know some of these people, lived in poverty in 2013. The state poverty rate was 18%, so we're better than the state, but to say that one out of six of our neighbors is in poverty and we accept that is really not a good thing. 30.8% of the county's residents were low income on average from 2011 to 2013, meaning their incomes were less than twice the federal poverty level, $46,100 for a family of four in 2013. Wages and income. The county's hourly median wage of $14.31 equaled 91.6% of the statewide median wage of 15.63 in 2015 and 78.8% of the living income standard for that county. The median hourly wage changed by 1.6% since the recovery began in 2009. So in effect, the people out here working now, the median wage is actually lower than what you're seeing around the state and as uh, was presented to the county commissioners in the last couple meetings, if you were a, a working woman or man with a house with two kids and you're divorced, you need to make about $24 an hour for the household to actually reach a median livable wage. These are things we should consider. Median household income in the county was $56,981, which equaled 124% of statewide household income of $45,195. That means that we have a lot of folks that have money, but there's an awful lot of people in this county that need something that need help, that need, that need leadership from the town and the county. The richest 5% of Chatham County's households had an average income that was 27 times greater than that of the poorest fifth of the households and six times greater than that of the middle fifth. So essentially, the top 5% in this county are 27 times wealthier than the bottom. 
and this is something to consider when we're looking at these options. Housing, 52% of renters in this county were unable to afford the fair market rent for a two bedroom housing unit. Three minutes are up. Okay, I will submit this to the record. Thank you. you know, and, and anyone can see this. Um, I do have one thing to say uh, that was uh, mentioned earlier. A solution for a lot of these problems are within you and within the county and the people. I know that you will get there. For instance, a tax overlay district, which has been put on the table, would be something that would solve some of the concerns that were raised even when I was mayor. Thank you very much, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you, former Mayor Holden. Next, we have Ms. D. Reed. Uh, my name is Dee Reed, and I'm at 590 Old Goldstone Road in Pittsburgh, where I've lived for more than 30 years. I thought Mr. Bowler's comments were really interesting about the unemployment and poverty in Chatham County. And the question, of course, is who's going to make money off of Chatham Park? And I would argue that most of the people that are going to make money off of Chatham Park are sitting in this room right now. This is the third time you've had a chance to reconsider the Chatham Park Master Plan, as so many local citizens have respectfully and repeatedly implored you to do. If you approve the so-called master plan yet again, there will be a third lawsuit because there are hundreds of people who love Pittsburgh who haven't given up on our amazing town yet. We just keep wondering why there are four of you who seem to have. We're wondering when you will set some real standards for Chatham Park, reasonable standards that any community would require to protect its rivers, streams, and drinking water. Standards that would avoid forcing all Chatham taxpayers to bear the cost to build those necessary schools in Chatham Park, for Chatham Park. Standards that would require roadways to effectively connect Chatham Park to the rest of Pittsburgh. Without this, your own consultant said that Chatham Park would tear the heart out of our downtown. We haven't asked you to reject Chatham Park, but we have implored you to make it worthy of Pittsburgh. Instead, You've rejected the best advice of your expert consultant, your own staff, and the good people who love living and working in Pittsburgh today. You also reneged on your promise to involve citizens and Pittsburgh matters in your committee meetings on Chatham Park. You never explained why you had a change of heart on that. You chose instead to continue having those meetings behind closed doors. You never explained why you did that. You've ignored the reasonable requests of Pittsburgh citizens while embracing carry developers with maximum flexibility to do pretty much whatever they want to do. We know that Chatham Park Investors is expecting you to rubber stamp this master plan ASAP, so we're kind of expecting that you'll probably do that too. Why do they want that? Because what they want more than anything right now is to get approval for the North Village teed up the most intense, dense part of this massive project with high-rise office buildings and condos on the most fragile land and streams feeding the Haw River, our drinking water supply. Chatham Park investors are snapping their fingers once again to get their new downtown teed up before the municipal election this fall. It's not that they have plans to begin building there yet. They don't, they can't. They don't even have the water and sewer. No, what they want is your permission, your, your approval, to develop so that they have it before the election and also just in case they'd rather flip the property than develop it themselves. If you give Chatham Park investors the green light on this master plan, they will be one giant step closer to their goal of making as much profit as possible off of this land, and they will have taken, and you will have taken one more giant step backward, far removed from your promises to engage citizens in public discussions of site plans. I'm almost done. If the North Village is fast tracked, you, they will have succeeded once again in rushing you minutes, into a bad decision. Sadly, it feels to me that Chatham Park investors is already running our town. The evidence is everywhere. So why don't we just acknowledge that? take down the Welcome to Pittsburgh signs, replace them with, with Welcome to Chatham Park. Mrs. Reed. And we could even use those nice signs with the cheery little trees that have been changed into office buildings. Thank you. Next we have Mr. Jeffrey Starkweather. Jeffrey Starkweather, 590 Old Goldson Road, Pittsburgh. I would like to paint a word picture of Pittsburgh's future if you do not put Pittsburgh back in the driver's seat by passing the type of alternative master plan the citizens in the Lawrence Group have repeatedly requested. 
Chatham Park's upper middle class residents, chain store dominated North Bell Asian Village centers, and office high rises will dramatically increase property values and taxes, as well as residential and commercial prices and rents. Within a decade, Pittsburgh will be unaffordable for working folk. CPI claims it will not raise property taxes because of all the business they bring in, yet there is no place in the U.S. where such developments have not resulted in increased property tax. Witness Wake County. Downtown Pittsburgh will be a ghost town after 5 p.m. and on weekends. Chatham Park will only attract national retail chains because their rents are so high. This will destroy local retail business. Downtown will consist primarily of lawyers, realtors, insurance companies, and restaurants that only serve breakfast and lunch. Moreover, downtown business will be killed by the lack of east-west road connections and the four-lane bypass that takes all traffic on 15501 and US 64 directly to Chatham Park's commercial areas. As the Lawrence Group wrote, this road system will cut the heart out of Pittsburgh. Assuming that all the jobs that they're predicting will come in their 16.6 million square feet of office aid, how many folks, local folks, will be getting those jobs? <clears throat> Virtually none. For every professional job, it will be three to four low-paying service jobs. Those service workers cannot afford to live in Chatham Park. They will be forced to live in newly created, sprawl, moderate-income housing and trailer parks, mostly in the countryside west of Pittsburgh. Of course, that high-tech job bonanza is highly questionable given their original demand premise was that RTP was full. It is not. Of course, there will be the stuck in traffic that 55,000 residents will bring, especially since the proposed piecemeal sprawl residential developments in the forest next to the Hot River and Jordan Lake will make transit financially infeasible. I need not detail the deterioration of our quality of life, water quality environment that has already been uh, repeatedly documented. Finally, we can't forget about local democracy here, as this Kerry developer has already demonstrated. They do not believe in any form of transparency or citizen input and will essentially dictate land use and infrastructure policies for their own financial benefit. Right now, the only evidence I can provide you that these impacts will occur is the experience of virtually every community in America that has turned its future over to it's such... It's a stop weather in three minutes around. I just have one sentence, thanks. One a such large outside developer. But without requiring an overall plan for the development and objective overall impact assessments, um, that citizens repeatedly requested. Any promise Chatham Park has made to you is simply developer puffery. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Starkweather. Next we have Mr. Sonny Peter. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, and 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 members of the and members of the board, 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 for several universities ranging from NC State University on the East Coast to the University of Southern California on the West Coast. I taught a variety of graduate level public administration courses including planning. When I taught planning, I would tell my students that the first and most important step in the planning process is to accurately forecast the future that is under consideration. I would emphasize that while long-term forecasts involved more uncertainty, it is still possible to see broad trends, much as one can see the broad outlines of the Appalachian Mountains when you're miles away just west of Morganton. This brings me to our discussion tonight. Here we're talking about long-term planning stretching out 40 years to 2055. This involves planning carried out by Chatham Park investors, the Pittsburgh Board of Commissioners, and indirectly the Chatham County Board of Commissioners and the Chatham County Economic Development Corporation. When I look at this planning, I come away with the overwhelming impression that the planning being undertaken tacitly assumes the next 40 years extending to 2055 essentially will be a repeat of the 40 years extending from 1959 when the Triangle Park was formed 
to 1999 when the park was largely mature. This forecast assumes the RTP economic development plan that worked from 1959 to 1999 will work again in Chatham County. All we have to do is largely copy the past. The problem with this RTP 40-year forecast is that it avoids reality and is bound to fail. To understand why this is so, all one has to do is to pay attention to the encyclical issued by the Roman Catholic Church last week under the leadership of Pope Francis, and similar 2014 documents issued by the Church of England, the World Bank, the U.S. Defense Department, the Central Intelligence Agency, the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and the U.S. National Academy of Science, among many others. All of these documents point to a 40-year future that will be very different from the 1959 to 1999 years of the Research Triangle Park. In the best case scenario, by 2055, we will be faced with a greenhouse changed world that will be hotter and a world with more extreme weather patterns and a world with much greater political and economic instability. In the worst case, by 2055, we will be faced with the irreversible process of collapse of the natural and social systems throughout the world that have undergird civilization. For this reason, Chatham Park, Pittsburgh, and Chatham County should abandon the RTP forecast that now Great. underpins economic planning in Chatham County. In the process, Pittsburgh should require a totally new Chatham Park master plan, one that acknowledges 21st century realities as noted in the Catholic Church in Central. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kisa. We next have Ms. Mrs. Virginia Chambers. Hi, Virginia Chambers, 246 W. Smith Road, Pittsburgh. Um, my husband is a small business owner in Pittsburgh, and um, I really feel strongly um, if what resonated with me was what the woman said when she said, uh, what are you planning to do with our lives? Because I think the lives of many small business owners are at stake. How many of you have seen little small towns who have died because the bypass went around them. I think that's what's going to happen to Pittsburgh unless there's a really clear, solid roads plan, which we have not seen to date, for example. Um, and my concern is that um, although we are very much in favor of growing our businesses and growing our town, this plan or the lack of the details for the plan is not representative of the vision that we all hope, the future we all hope our town to have. Um, so I very much support um, uh, deeper uh, uh, due diligence into in investigating the details of the plans. I, I respect that the, it takes a huge amount and an investment of time. And um, I think that the, the meager investments that the uh, Chatham Park officials have been describing that sound very impressive, but we know that it's only a tiny fraction of what they stand to make off of the, uh, their development. Um, it's just, that's a drop in the bucket compared to the potential loss that we will experience of our quality of life and, uh, and of our personal um, uh, livelihoods in, in the town. Um, I think it's okay to say that you're wrong. I think it's always a uh, respect, respectable thing to do to admit that you're wrong <coughs> and to be able to go back and say, okay, what can I do better? So I encourage you to not tear the heart out of our downtown, to not uh, destroy the quality of life that we have in our county, and to just, you know, be uh, humble and admit that you could have made some mistakes and to try to do a better job from here on out of looking out for our interests. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mrs. Chambers. We have no one else signed up to speak at this particular time. Uh, therefore, we will go out of public hearing. Or someone did get a chance to speak. No, he didn't sign up. Has the pastor given people a chance to? She came and I guess the sign up sheet was already called. Okay, that's the only one. Come on forward. <coughs> Please indicate your name and address. Uh, my name is Sarah Smith. And my address is 600 East Road. Uh, 
Um, I feel like everyone here has covered the issues pretty well and said most of what was on my mind. Um, I just wanted to go over just thinking about the project and the impacts, and I have a few questions. Um, what are the water needs for a fully implemented Chatham Park? How much water can our water supply support? Have we done this? Have we looked into that? Um, what's our wastewater treatment? Um, how much traffic are we to expect realistically? How much are we actually looking at? How is that going to integrate with our existing traffic flows? How is it going to integrate with that? Um, new schools, what are expected needs for new schools? Um, how many additional students can our current schools absorb um, before they reach capacity? Um, and then allocating the space for building new schools, I know that um, that was mentioned. Um, who's going to finance that construction? Will this fall on Pittsburgh taxpayers? Um, taxes, uh, what, what are the costs that the taxpayers will absorb? Um, in terms of the roads, the schools, public services, police and other <coughs> transportation, um, other issues like that. Um, in terms of the downtown, um, how will Chatham Park affect our historic downtown? How will it affect the tourism or small businesses, the so traffic flows again, parking, pedestrian access? In terms of natural areas, what are our plans for flood mitigation? Have we done the studies on the water, the risk assessments? Um, the runoff from this, all these roads, you know, factoring that into treating the water, and so basically to sum this up, I just come up with all these questions and it just feels loose and I feel like I can't find the answers to these questions. As a young person living here in Pittsburgh, looking to make my future, and yeah, of course I'm excited about potential economic opportunities, but it seems like this plan is still vague and tenuous. And for something as massive as it is, it shouldn't be at this stage. Um, because I can't find the answers to all of those questions. And it seems like um, there needs to be more homework done. There needs to be more research. There needs to be those, the master plan needs to account for these questions because these issues, just if they're not addressed now, it's not that they won't go away. They're still going to remain. We'll still have to figure out what to do with traffic and. Um, all of the issues that everyone before me has brought up. Um, and so I ask that you reconsider and ask the Chatham Park to present a master plan that answers these questions. Thank you, Mrs. Smith. This now ends our public hearing. We need a motion to go out of public hearing at this time. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Thank you. Next, we'll move forward to old business wastewater treatment plant expansion. Mr. Roy. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. I'm going to be as brief as humanly possible the busy agenda tonight. Uh, I'm pleased to present the 80% preliminary engineering report for the uh, alternatives analysis to look at the expansion of our existing wastewater treatment plant from 750,000 gallons a day of treatment capacity to 1.249 million gallons a day of treatment capacity. Um, this this PER um, has been worked on for uh, almost six months. It's been fast-tracked, if you will. Uh, we've requested that because we wanted to have a final PER by <coughs> September 1, when if the town decided to discuss uh, possible funding op options with the state. That's their six-month cycle. It's in September and March of each year. So... Um, we can move forward. I'm going to introduce a few slides and then I'm going to bring on um, 
um, Carl, who's with Wooten, to describe the alternatives and um, for you to ask him some technical questions, and then I'll wrap it up. So the uh, flow summary there just shows you um, the build-out year is 2035. The, the state requires a 20-year time horizon. So it shows you um, Pittsburgh ETJ of uh, 1.749 MGD. Um, if you add Chatham Park into the mix separately, that's 2.7 MGD. And we just got those numbers from their engineers approximately a week ago. So the total project is, do uh, you mind going back once, uh, is 4.49 <laughs> is our um, projected flows for the 20 year period. That, that's not what we're designing to, that's just a requirement for Diener. And we have to back that up with numbers. So. Um, does that include the other growth that will happen around Chatham Park? Or is that just yeah, that, that includes Pittsburgh and the ETJ, okay. just the extraterritorial jurisdiction. So everywhere in a, within our planning jurisdiction, based on current zoning, the number using Diener's calculations that you have to use is 1.749. Um, I guess my question is that area is not just going to be Chatham Park. Yes. So the second bullet is wastewater discharge summary. Right. Can I interrupt? Yeah. The Diener numbers you represent, you are quoting, is that the um, vacant acreage figure that is required? There's an equation we use based on this current zoning. Okay. Um, I don't know if you want to expand on that a little bit. But it's when Carl's up, you could, okay. you could re retool that question. Go so the um, the bottom bullet includes kind of a net um, discharge after you take into consideration to reclaim water, um, as well as for, for the town and for Chatham Park, and th those are um, wastewater discharge summaries. So the good news about that bullet is it it brings the total down to 2.8 MGD, which is below our current 3.22 MGD permit. So we're not immediately looking at how else are we going to handle this for the next 20 years, but we believe we have enough uh, enough of a enough of a plan to go forward with remaining in our current 3.22 permit horizon. Okay. Sorry. Sure. So Fred, this I'm is putting you asleep. <laughs> Fred, this is 20 year estimate projection right. and I think Chatham Park's figures are a 30 or a 40 year so this is not build out. No, we shake, we had them shave off and just come down to 2035 for this I think, purpose. I think 4.4 million was the build out figure. That sounds right. But, um, so this graph shows the 20 year horizon from left to right. Um, the green line is the town of Pittsburgh and their ETJ without Chatham Park, but with all, all the other lands. And so that number comes up to below 2, two MGD. If you add in um, Chatham Park's numbers, and this includes reclaimed water, both on the Pittsburgh and the Chatham Park side kind of combined, we come in uh, below 3.2 right there. Um, and then the, the last number is, um, Full build out, I believe that's um, four or five. Yeah, that goes over, but it, I think that takes off the uh, reclaim uh, number, and I'll have Carl clarify that. These, these numbers are up to 2035. Chatham Park, Park is looking at, uh, you know, based upon their plans, they're looking at having that reuse component, and we just wanted to see if you didn't have that reuse component, where would you be? Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a thing to say, okay, well, there is a dependence on that reuse portion of Chatham Park in order to hit, to be able to, to discharge in your permit at this time frame, at the 20-year time frame. And the reason you use a 20-year time frame in, in terms of what we're looking at is because that's, when we look for state funding, that's the time frame that they look at. That's how they'll fund you. They'll look at you know, whatever your infrastructure needs are in that 20-year period. That's what they'll be looking for. 
And so to, to break the numbers out in such a way that I think helps me think about it, the volume of effluent that's being delivered to the plant is the upper figure. And that is broken out between what is discharged to the river and what is recycled right. into the system. Right. That the highest volume there, yeah, right, would be what would be, it's not necessarily delivered to the treatment plant, but it's what would be generated. Generated. Then the part that you're taking out is what they're going to reuse or reclaim, as they say. They may use it to, um, you know, water, irrigate. They may they have a lot of different uses, and I honestly don't know all the uses that Chatham Park is, is, but it, is, but is choosing. But all, all of this is arriving at the plant to be treated, and it's being well, treated either to discharge into the river or being treated to be pumped back into... Well, what's estimated to come to the plant is on, or <clears throat> actually what's going to be generated, the plant can only handle 1.245 MGD, mm -hmm. 1.249 MGD, which is the where the purple ends on here, okay? Um, and that's based on the permit, the discharge permit to Robeson Creek. There's a separate discharge permit a second outfall permit on the Hall River, and that's in the overall permit. So there's two outfalls. There's right. one to Robeson Creek and one to the Hall River. And this, the 3.22 you see there is a combination of those two outfalls. They each allow a certain volume of flow to go to those rivers, mm -hmm. to those discharges. And the Robeson Creek, they're going to allow 1.249 MGD to go to that creek and then at, at the uh, haw, it's going to be 1.97 MGD. So you have to look at it on a collective basis because of the way that the permit is written. Looking into the future, um, the point is is that at, you can discharge up to the 3.22 with the existing permits that you have. When you get above that number, then you have to look for other alternatives of discharge if you get above that number. What's going happening here is we're showing that based upon a combination of our projections for uh, the, the town of Pittsburgh in the city limits plus the ETJ, <coughs> not including Shannon Park, that, that's what that green line is showing right there. Mm -hmm. okay, that's the wastewater generated from that area. Then when you add in Chatham Park, you get that second curve there. But that curve includes reuse water. They're going to they're gonna generate wastewater that's going to be within their own decentralized systems or within their own systems, they're going to handle that in little chunks, okay? And either in little chunks or they're going to build their own treatment plant that would eventually go to the Hall River, okay? But that, but that portion there is shown, it's just to show that at that point, you won't be beyond what you can discharge to the Haw and the Robeson Creek combined. But it relies on reuse. It does rely on reuse. So it relies on treating a larger volume not to discharge to either point or beyond the limits. Right, of the You're gonna, that water is going to be reused somewhere else, or it's going to be reclaimed water. One of the two. Right. It's not that portion is not directly going to go to either of the river or the creek because it, it's not just it's not permitted for that. So without a reclaimed system within 20 years, we will, or at some point, we will. Well, wherever it crosses that that line there, that right. that colored line there, the top color. Once it gets into the white. If you get in the white and there's no reclaim, then you're above the permit, the discharge volume allowed by your existing permits. Okay. Just, does that make sense? Yep. And so on this, the, so the main point of this graph, there's a couple of, of points in here, is that, like Fred was saying, we would be below the 3.22, but we are relying on, you know, we're taking the data that Chatham Park is giving us in terms of what they're projecting and what they're projecting for the reclaim. Okay. Any more questions on that? that makes sense. So. What we've done so far is, given that there's there's an opportunity here to expand the existing wastewater treatment plant, and the treatment plant's at the end of Small Street. If you just take Small Street and went south, you run into it eventually. And that existing plant is is a what they call an activated sludge plant, and it has a number of large tanks. And, and the basic premise in all this is that you have wastewater that comes to the plant, you use tanks to treat it, there's bacteria in these tanks, 
and then you settle those bacteria out in what they call clarifier, and then you filter it, and then um, after you filter it, you disinfect it, and then you discharge it to the river, to the creek in this case, Robeson Creek. Now, the existing treatment plant already does have some reclaimed water capacity already. There's already at this time at the treatment plant, there is approximately 55 to 60,000 gallons per day being reclaimed. It's being sent up to the 3M Corporation at this time. So there is some reclaimed water happening right now at the existing wastewater treatment plant. The current capacity of the plant is, is 0.75 MGD. In essence, we're, we're looking at expanding it to 1.249. So it's a little over a 60% increase in the capacity of the plant. And um, there's three different ways we're focusing on options that we're looking at right now. And then up to this point where we are, we've developed costs, which I'll get to later, we've developed some capital costs. There's these three alternatives, which are on-plant alternatives uh, down at the treatment plant. The first one is called biological nutrient removal. The permit requires that you move, remove more nitrogen now than you are, and that you remove uh, more phosphorus than you are now. That's what we, when we say the word nutrients in, in wastewater speak. That means total nitrogen and phosphorus removal. It's also called BNR for biological nutrient removal. In a perfect world, what, one of the challenges, the biggest challenges of the wastewater plant site right now is it's got a small area. So um, we wanted to look at a conventional a system that would be easy to operate, and, and, and that's what this one is here. So you, you go through that and then um, <laughs> move it along, right? <laughs> uh, the second option is to, is to do an option which uses less land and concentrates the treatment capacity of the bacteria in a smaller volume, and you would get rid of a um, you'd be able to use the, the filter instead of, uh, you use a membrane instead of the uh, uh, treatment system now and you would follow disinfection and move on. And move on from that. It's called a membrane bioreactor. It's one of the newer innovative types of reactions. The main thing there is you can save space and you can do more treatment in, in a smaller body. <coughs> and then the third one is called an integrated fixed film. It's, it's got a fancy name called IFAS. And again, the idea on that is to try to make more treatment in a smaller volume using bacteria on plastic meat. Um, those are the three different alternatives. If you go to the next slide, there's, there's a layout here of the conventional layout. And the big differences between all three of these are, again, is in, in the land area and the type of treatment used. The conventional would require purchase of approximately three and a half acres north of the existing plant. And this is basically the tried and true uh, standard conventional method. And so as part of this, we show a, a bunch of treatment tanks up north, and then the southern part where the existing plant is would become more of a sludge treatment area. As you, as you treat more flow, you produce more sludge that has to be dealt with. So that's that option. Then the MBR layout is a smaller uh, land area. Uh, in this option, you'd be using these membranes, and these membranes can be fit in a much smaller area. So in that sense, we have a little bit of land we have to buy here, which is what we're looking to purchase. would be approximately one acre, but quite a bit less than the other one. Um, this process is an innovative technology. And the, the main purpose of it, again, is to use these membranes to shrink the, the size of the tanks that you need. And then the last, um, last layout shows that you need a little bit more space. Um, you need approximately one and a half to two acres in addition to what you have now in order to have that, that option work. So in a nutshell, the, the three different ones, there's, there's the conventional, as far as three and a half acres, the um, BNR requires maybe one acre, and the other one is one and a half to two acres. Um, there's a, another option, there's another piece of land up north. One of the big problems at the Pittsburgh, which our tree plant is when the, the rain comes and the storm flows happen, you get a big spike in how much rain, how much water comes to the plant. So this, this particular option here looks at if we had a offline, a different site used for equalization 
of the wastewater. In other words, you, when the water comes in, you pump a little bit over to the side and you let it sit there for a while. You treat the water that comes in and then the water that you put aside, you pump back slowly into the wastewater plant so it can be treated. It's a way to keep big flows from coming all at once at the treatment plant. So this option here is looking at putting some concrete tanks in a different area which is just directly northwest of the existing site. What this does is it allows easier construction, allows you to free up some space in the existing site to do other things uh, that are helpful for the treatment, uh, which would reduce the amount of land you would have to buy that I was just showing earlier. So that's an off-site. Um, here, I'm not going to go through every, every bit of this, but there's a lot of different um, alternative comparison here in terms of pros and cons. And, and the main difference in here is that when you go to conventional, you have larger tanks, you have more concrete, you have bigger construction to do. Um, the, the MBR, which is the, the membrane bioreactor, you have less construction, less smaller tanks to make, less construction to do, and you can eliminate some of the units that are there now. And that, that makes the plant um, a little bit simpler to operate. Uh, the IFAS, which is the one with the plastic media that you put in the tanks, that one's similar to the other two. Um, it's a little bit, it's basically an in-between in terms of the, the advantages and disadvantages. Uh, next slide. Um, there is a fourth option that um, it's in the back of your packets. I don't have a um, slide for it, but you had received um, some information packet, and there's a one of the options that is required to look at that you're required to look at for Diener is to look at um, regionalization, and, and in this case, that would be taking the wastewater from Pittsburgh and pumping it to Sanford. Sanford recently expanded their wastewater treatment plant and they do have um, some excess capacity at this point. And if you look in the back of your packet here, I apologize I didn't put a slide in here, but it looks like this. Basically a force main route. What this option would be is to, to collect the wastewater. It comes down to the treatment plenty house, you put a pump station down there and pump it over to, to Sanford. And then they would, they would treat it at their wastewater treatment plant. Um, the, the force main is about eight and a half miles, and we've done a cost estimate, a capital cost estimate for comparison with the other alternatives of expanding the existing plant where it is right now. Where we haven't gone yet is we have not done, when you look at these alternatives from a cost perspective, you have to look not only at the capital cost, which is what it costs to build right now, you also have to look at what are the annual operating costs. And those annual operating costs, if they're very high and your capital cost is low, it still may end up in, in the long run that you're better off going with one that has a higher capital cost and a lower operation cost. So at this point right now in the PER, we're presenting this 80% and, and we're not done with that part of it, with going to the, the next point which says, what is the combination of O&M and capital cost together and how does that cost work? Um, on the the pumping to Sanford, there is a good substantial portion of that um, route right now where they have limited access to Highway 15501, which is the main part of the route. And we're, we're right now we're, we're discussing with DOT because basically along about six miles of that route, we, we wouldn't be able to use the right of way. We'd have to go and get private easements all along that route. Now we're checking about that right now to double check that with DOT. That's what it's currently set up for. Uh, we're going to be, and part of our, our future work is to check up on that and look closer at that. But we had to put in that kind of cost for some of the easements. I, I have to be honest, I don't know exactly what uh, the total cost of the easements were at this point. I did have to break down that in terms of having it memorized in my head right now, but that, there is a substantial cost in that. There's also a substantial cost, just so everyone knows in the future, that if you pump to Sanford, they expect you to put money up for the plant they already built, the debt service that they have. So you're like buying into the plant they already built. So that, based upon the information we've gotten from that, just that O&M alone is a million dollars to pay off their debt service. The treatment plant right now is about $600,000 off. So you can see that that's why we don't have a final number here. So even though that this the the pump to 
Sanford number looks a little lower than the other alternatives, I don't want you to jump to the conclusion that based on the capital costs, oh, that's the way we should go. Because those O&M costs are real important, especially when we talk about Sanford. Um, the bottom line on this is that you've got um, some treatment plant costs ranging you know, for an upgrade anywhere from 15 to $16.7 million. So that's, uh, we'll be looking at that for funding. Uh, with, with Dean are looking for loan funding or any other funding you can get for that. But that's, this gives you a snapshot of where we are right now to give you a sense of the magnitude of the cost. I'll just add a few, is this the last one? Yeah. Um, some of the factors in these alternatives are um, trying to avoid the floodplain. Um, there's, a, there's an area on the south side of the uh, existing equalization basins where it is floodplain, but it would be nice to have basins there. So we would have to look at that in terms of um, our ordinance and if we want to spend the money to do a no-rise modeling to see if it would impact the floodplain. Um, that's something I personally would want to avoid. So we'd, we'd be back to looking at other pieces of land in the immediate area. Um, so that's one of the challenges. The other challenge is, is there's a residential neighborhood to the north that we always have to be pay very close attention to. With this, there's a pr proposed residential neighborhood to the east, um, the habitat property. So we would need to take that into consideration um, there's also some other property across the creek to the west that um, was recently brought to my attention that, that may be available just to review. So there's more work to do here. This is an 80% snapshot. Um, I'm pleased with Wooten of how fast they've done this work. Uh, they did an incredible amount of work in a very short amount of time. Um, and they've, uh, they're ready to continue on the, the, the tight schedule we gave them to have basically the 100% done in uh, August 22nd meeting. Brian, was that August 22nd or 20th? Well, if we can do it the first meeting in August. Yeah. I think August 22nd was the... That was the final, yeah. yeah. That, that's the meeting we want to for sure be finished with. So we'll, maybe we'll try to hit the meeting before that. Um, so if there's any other questions that I or Carl could take tonight, that'd be great. Otherwise, it's just uh, for your information. Thank you, Mr. Lord. I appreciate it. I've got, a, I've got some comments or questions. Um, one of the things that struck me is the INI flow. And I'm looking at the figures for increasing capacity, and it's, you know, $32 a gallon for virtually all of those scenarios at $16 million, assuming I'm dealing with the right volume. And I'm wondering. Um, I can imagine that solving the I and I problem could be a really cost-effective way to increase volume capacity. That, yeah, that's correct. Um, so we do have an I and I issue, as you're all aware. Um, we're in the process of writing an RFQ to begin that process. Um, how much of an impact will that have on our wet weather flows is really anyone's guess at this point. Talking to the folks who've done this for 30 years, um, they, they'll tell you if, if you can get down, if you can shave 10% off where you're at now with wet weather flows, 10 to 30%, you're doing pretty darn good. Especially with our aged infrastructure, if we repair certain areas and it shows to be effective, that doesn't guarantee in three years we'll have another impact from another area due to the age of our system. So but but it, is, it is important to go after our aged collection system with um, what's called an asset management plan and really target and programmatically make repairs and do smoke testing and kind of continually, continually doing this. So hopefully we'll be able to figure out a way to do that within the enterprise fund. How, how do we look? I mean, how does our system look relative to other systems? Are we abnormally high in the INI? Relatively speaking, you are. Yeah. Um, How bad? The you know we we did a look at what kind of flows you were getting at the treatment plant. You know, took a look at that, and you can get flows that are about 
Um, your average, if you look at you know what the treatment plant can handle, you know what they're operating at that right now. I'll just throw it. It's 300 to 400 gallons per minute, and then on a daily basis is kind of what their flow rates. You can get flows into the plant. The estimated is up to 2,800 gallons per minute in a really you know in a bad storm with the peak flow coming in. So that's 28, basically over four. So it's seven, almost seven times the average flow. The average flow. The average flow over the whole year, if you include the INI, is about 500,000 gallons per year. If you look at a volume, it takes the total volume treated over the whole year, stick over 365 days, you'll get about half a million gallons a year treated. If you look at the the INI component of that, is anywhere from five to seven times that when the storm happens. Now that's for a, a community this size, that's not totally out of the ballpark. Um, I, I've, I've worked with some that are as high as 10. You know, so it's not it's not absolutely horrible, but it's it can you know it can it can stand some improvement, but it's not so way out of whack versus other places that you know that your community is totally is totally on that and the the other thing was on the on the treatment on the capital cost we're, you know if we're looking probably at a, the cost estimates we have here are about twelve twelve and a half dollars per gallon treatment. So, just want to know. Okay. I'll just remind you that we did do the Credo Long Street repairs about three years ago. It did have an impact. It seemed to. It did. And then um, November 2013, it came roaring back from somewhere else. And that's what we're going after now. Okay. Um, if, you know, you've got in here table three talks about alternative comparisons. If yeah. you could add the Sanford option to that list of advantages and disadvantages, that would be really helpful. Okay. Um, and one of the things I think we should definitely consider is what are the odor considerations for each one of these options? Okay. Because there are times when it's, it's really quite, um, uh, quite strong. And just, just so you know, we've as, as we looked through these alternatives, we did include, you know, a cost for doing what they call aerobic digestion. A lot of the smells you're going to smell, or, or could be smelling, is from the sludge. That's a potential. You know, it is. You get you you, you treat this wastewater, and then it's a bacterial system that got to grow, and you got to continually get rid of the sludge that you produce at the treatment plant. Um, right now, what they do is they thicken that sludge and they put it in the basin, and sometimes if that Sludge is, is currently it's not fully digested, so sometimes that may be some of the smell you're smelling if that is released at all. That sludge. So um, yeah, we would be looking at, at odors pretty closely. The you know over the whole plant, you know this is uh, you've got blowers and you're blowing air into the water to treat it. Basically, the bacteria use the air, so you are aerating all the water as you're going along. Typically, um, there are some. Like I said, it, we're looking at aerobic digestion in this case, which is an aerated process. So the tank that we put in would be aerated. So we wouldn't expect as much odors as you might be expecting now from the sludge basin that's there, if, if that's what you're referring to. Well, it happens periodically. And maybe it is that there it's been stored for a length of time. Yeah, um, we can look into that closer to see what might be carrying that. Is that yeah. Is that what you're really yeah. saying? Too? Yep. And the other issue is how we're going to handle solids. Uh, we're going to look at other methods, uh, recycling using uh, basically modular boxes that are delivered to us. We fill them up, and then they haul them off and bring another one, so it's less exposure of the sludge. Uh, does, that, does that answer your question? Yeah. Any other questions from the board? Thank you. Thank you. Let's move forward with our agenda to Chatham Park Medical Office Building Number Two. Mr. Roger O'Connor. Good evening, Board of Commissioners. I'm Roger Walden from Clarion Associates, and I am happy to be 
uh, providing some help uh, to the town of Pittsburgh during your uh, period where you are uh, absent a planning director. And so we're, uh, we're working to staff your office during the day, and I'm here in the evening to uh, be presented to you. So uh, thank you for letting me speak. Uh, the application that's in front of you is for a medical office building for uh, the, the Chatham Park uh, development. The, this is part of a uh, some facilities that have already been come through the process already. The, uh, we've got this this uh, drawing up here, the site plan that shows the uh, in the lower right hand corner the hospice facility that you uh, approved, and then in the upper left hand corner the uh, uh, medical office building number one that, that, that you approved, and then just above that to the north. Uh, is the approximately 17,000 square feet that's proposed on medical office building too. So the uh, been a lot of planning already gone into this site uh, in terms of the uh, road networks, the uh, the, the infrastructure, uh, stormwater management, and so on. Uh, and the uh, our conclusion after uh, looking at all these plans, going through them, having them revised, is that this aligns with the uh, uh, the plans that have been. Before you, before uh, the, the master plan and the, and the uh, adjacent plans for facilities on the site, we brought this to the planning board, and the planning board recommended to you uh, that you approve the site plan, and that's our staff recommendation as well. Thank you, sir. Questions? As the uh, fire marshal. Um, reviewed and approved this. Yes, yes, okay. we, we've taken this out to all of the uh, all of the usual uh, all of the usual town departments and and, uh, and others who are involved in reviewing the applications. So yes. Okay. Uh, one thing I couldn't quite understand was there is reference to a public water easement, and it seems to be in an odd location. That and it doesn't make sense to me. Um, and it ha it is the tap to the two lines, domestic and fire, mm -hmm. that are going into the site, branching off, going uh, east and west, and then north around the building. And it appears as though it's on a piece to the east, which doesn't seem to be serving anything. So I'm curious to know what that was. Okay. Well. Um there are folks in the room who know more about that than I do. I think Fred Royal is probably still here and got the applicant here. Okay. So uh, let me ask one of them to step up and uh, answer your question. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm Philip Coltrip from Chatham Park. We have, uh, I know Fred has been dealing with this, but we also have the site designer. Uh, and during this process, you may see some of the seals or a different site designer. This is Jordan Brewer, who's now the site designer on this. He's here with the specifics of that uh, item and be happy to address your request. Okay. I'm Jordan Brewer with Killing Warren. So the specific um, public utility easement that you're referring to, it, it heads to the east and it ties into the existing public utility easement that was proposed on the medical office building one. And that is for access to the proposed sewer main on the rear of the property. So the requirement is that a two-wheel drive truck can traverse the site and access all of your manholes and then also your water meters. And okay. so that is what the uh, easement is meant to serve. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, when I look at the, the plan, I noticed that um, it's a Grant Drive. Uh, at the intersection of Grant and Suttles on the first site plan, MOB1, it, w it was shown and it was grayed out and it was difficult to see what was going on with the storm drainage. And I think I asked a question at the time, where is the storm drainage going? And I believe the answer was going to the BMP. Okay, when I look at this site plan for MOB2, it appears that that pipe is discharging into the roadside ditch on Suttles that I don't think goes to the BMP. So was unsure about that. Seems like there are two references to stormwater easements, one going to the pond, uh, one going to the roadside ditch. And the one in the roadside ditch shows a pipe. So 
Jordan would have was not sure about that. Drawn that it would be helpful uh, to have that. Yes, I'm not sure if he has the. It, it's sheet C um, C400. The grade and drainage plan. So it would be on the flash drive that I gave you on. If not, we'll just do it from. Right. And I believe you already you knew about this. Plan. Yeah. So the the roadside yeah. ditch. So the roadside ditch is actually further to the west along Suttles Road. The the drainage pipe that you're referring to has a drainage well that runs down to the BMP. It does. Yes, it does. So okay. there's a there's a proposed drainage ditch that is at the end of the flooded section there that runs down to the BMP. It wasn't well. Uh, it wasn't clear to me that that's what was going on. Yeah. So. So that is delivering water to the BMP, so that that's, that impervious is being treated. Correct. Okay. Great. Um, that's really it. Other than I noticed in the erosion control notes, it made reference reference to Diener, and I think this will be done by the county. It is, and the reason for that we checked into it when we did Metabolic Building One, it mm -hmm. still was Diener, and Got it. it picked up the. Uh, the notes from Metropolitan Building okay. 1. Okay. So it is the county, certainly. That's right. Okay. That's all I have. Do you have questions from the board? Yeah. I did, we did have one key feature on this site, and if I could just ask Toma to hold up. This is Toma that works with Michael Hain. Uh This is a, uh, an illustration of the building itself. And you're seeing two buildings, and in between these two buildings is this roof that's inverted. And this water, this is collecting rainwater. It is not part of our stormwater management system. That's taken care of. This is above and beyond that. We're collecting water to be filled in our own cisterns to be using for water on the site. So this is something that we were proud to have in this. We're also working in some architectural features into the building that I think are kind of more of the idea of us putting art on the building instead of in the building, making part of the building. But this was a feature that we wanted to make sure that we, the black and white illustrations don't do it justice. But this is one of the features that you'll see. This is actually the metaphor of building two that's under construction. So even the way that it's laid out so that you're stepping up the hill, the walls that are there, the retaining walls, everything has been planned out for these two buildings to work together. Similar materials, similar designs, but not copies. So that's also one of our intentions to go through this to go through the process. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that information. So basically, we actually need um, a motion to either approve the subject to the issuance of the storm water permit and authorization from the town uh, from the town engineer. So we need to entertain that motion at this time. Make a motion that we approve subject to uh, storm water uh, permit. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Move forward to our next item, which is fiscal year 2015-2016 annual budget ordinance and capital improvement pro program resolution. Thank you very much. Um, I appreciate the uh, opportunity to discuss this again this evening. Um, you have uh, put a lot of work and provided some uh, great recommendations and I think the document that you have for you this evening uh, reflects uh, those recommendations and ultimately uh, provides the community with the budget uh, that puts us in sound uh, financial condition and sets us up uh, for, I think, future um, 
future, a better future maintenance and operations of our current system. We're going to be able to uh, continue the improvements that we've made on the operational side of our wastewater plant and our water treatment plant over the past couple of years. Um, and, and then also, too, I think allows us to prepare for any growth uh, that we might, uh, might hear. Here we might have some growth on the way, so I think this puts us in a pretty good position to start accounting for that uh, as well. Um, the cover page that I put um, before you on the budget uh, reflects, um, for the most part, uh, the changes uh, in the inputs uh, and direction that you provided staff. Uh, and I won't go, uh, I won't go down through each page on those quite yet. Uh, I will um, point out that we do have uh, a couple of. Uh, minor modifications, I think, uh, to the document that, that you were provided. Um, and uh, maybe I'll let uh, Nancy go into those uh, right now. Um, but essentially, we're looking at some, some changes on a couple of uh, a couple of items. I think the first one, I'm, well, I'll just go ahead and talk and you can go ahead and interrupt me. Yeah, right. page, page five, uh, sorry, page five. Uh, on, uh, you'll see down at the bottom um, that uh, we, we did uh, make sure that that $12,000 was accounted for. Um, so the, the line of uh, expenditures in the recreation near the bottom of page 5, the lower right-hand corner, uh, should be changed to 235158 which is... Um, computer is not letting me. There to show you exactly where that is. And I think uh, uh, Nancy has provided you with, uh, with that, that sheet reflecting that change. So. No, I don't. I'm oh. not getting the copy of that. Okay, one. sorry about that. We'll make that change you know, right there. Right I think it's a 223 on your copy. I discovered that when I was cross putting everything. Okay, so the one that we have on the web page is, is accurate? Yes, the one on the web page is that's, accurate. That's what's right here, is right off. Yes. I'm feeding this off the web page. So that's the 12,000. Yes, I requested 12,000. It was corrected in the governing board, and for some reason my link didn't save, and it's been corrected in the recreation piece of it, and I discovered that this morning. So it doesn't affect the total? No, because the total is still correct, 4,021. Again, there is a linking problem. <laughs> Okay, Nancy, I think the other one was on page uh, 30 or 31. Uh, it was page 31 and 32, where um, the backup detail initiative that I did in the the total, the department total is 110,000 in change, which it should have, should be the one I just handed out to you, which is 427, 198. When I, it was a copy and pasting issue with my, um, we were school and put engineering budget there instead of um, planning budget when I was uh, um, tweaking, and so that was that was my my error. Um, so what you see, the 427198 is the actual budget, and it is correct in the overall total budget. It's just in your uh, board packet, it said 110 and change. And, and some of some of this uh, some of this headache on our part, and, you know, it, I'll admit, is kind of left over from last year, and this. The, 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 the software and then the spreadsheets that, that Nancy uses to kind of calculate these numbers have to be kind of by brute force sometimes copied, pasted, and entered into these tables which are essentially plugged into a Word document. So, you know, we try to, we try to get it uh, as best as we can and, and before we pass it, I think this is our final last go around is to correct and fix yeah. some of these numbers here. So right, the one, the one up on the web is correct. The one, this is off the web yeah. and so this is 427198, mm -hmm. so that's what, that's what we're looking at. Mm -hmm. That's that what we use. Um, and then I think those were it as far as the ones that we made on the fly. The other thing that we would, the other thing that we would hand out, I think this evening would be the memo, it was Mary Terry request to requested an overview of the capital items and I believe these items are, are provided. Yes, that should be neat. Yeah, I copied that with you. These items are provided uh, in some detail within the budget document under the capital improvement program, but, but uh, if you're reading pleasure, we've listed them out and 
this reflects the, um, the purchases or the, the proposed purchases uh, for capital um, items uh, that cost over $5,000 and the items or the, the um, lines that they fall under. And you know, again, we don't want to don't want to create. Um, I don't think we want to. We're not necessarily creating any new information here or new, any new requests. We're just simply reflecting the pieces that have already been plugged into uh, our budget, and I think to a large point have already been discussed uh, up till now. Um, so at, at the mayor's request, we we put those capital improvement items. Uh, listed them out and put them in front of you uh, again this evening, again, for, uh, just for your, um, your review. The general notes, um, you know, just, I don't know if you want me to run down these, but uh, back on, if we go back to, uh, we go back to page five. Page five, as we already mentioned, we accounted for the administration. Um, uh, or if you go up to B, uh, expenditures, you'll see that we reduced the administration by 12,000 uh, and plugged in that 12,000 in recreation, and that was to essentially accommodate for the uh, expenditure that we had in previous last well couple budgets that I've worked on previously for um, Chatham, uh, for, well, excuse me, for the um, Pittsburgh Express in conjunction with Chapel Hill Transit. As you guys are aware, the county uh, had approved, uh, I believe they've approved now, a budget that does uh, reflect a new relationship with uh, Chatham Transit to provide the same services. And for this fiscal year, the county uh, is has proposed, and I believe they have approved, uh, a budget that will pay for the costs of the program that were previously assumed by the town of Pittsburgh. So at, at your discussion and direction, we, we plugged up those, those $12,000. We took those $12,000 from administration and put that into recreation, which our intent would be to plug that into the Page Vernon Memorial Park project. Clear as mud so far. Uh, page, near page six, uh, section two. Uh, section 2, uh, Enterprise Fund Revenues and Expenditures. Um, we uh, updated to uh, reflect the current uh, the, the current totals on that. I think we just... There's a linking, linking problem again. Linking problem with the numbers that, uh, that Nancy, I, I believe, caught in, and we have now put in there. Page 7, um, they're down on, uh, if you go to page 7, section 6, which is general fees, general fund fees and charges for service, uh, paragraph C, where you see zoning, site plan review, petition for annexation, subdivision application fees. We added three items for uh, E, conditional zoning, F, plan development district zoning, and G, small area plan, and uh, corresponding fees with those. Uh, I believe those were uh, also at your direction. Uh, page nine, uh, we go to, uh, the same vein um, on page 9B, stormwater ordinance fees, 3, EMP facility fee, we increased it from 50 to $500. Uh, so we'll be able to collect um, when, we, when we assess or um, when we apportion a stormwater ordinance fee to a project for um, a BMP structure review, we'll be able to collect uh, a more equitable uh, fee for that to help uh, accommodate our inspections and maintenance and, and so forth for those structures, which I think is a good, uh, sound financial decision. And, and uh, I believe that also uh, came from your discussion. Right? So page 10, uh, section 7, enterprise fees and rates. Um, the, uh, under A, um, water and wastewater rate schedule. Uh, those numbers right there reflect uh, the increases that uh, um, you all put uh, a lot of thought and, and discussion uh, in that we had, we had talked about a little bit uh, earlier tonight and also at previous meetings and then also starting off uh, a, a few months earlier with a discussion from uh, uh, UNC's Environmental Finance Program kind of got the ball rolling for us in terms of uh, looking at rates and studying them. 
um, those numbers are reflective of those rates that, that uh, you discussed at this point. Um, we also increased a reconnection fee for our disconnects from 25 to 45. Uh, and I believe this is in, in um, this is also in, in looking at uh, neighboring communities and, and what they also use for reconnection. Um, and then also we took from those from that increase um, we plugged in the expected revenues from that increase and we put that into the budget uh, as well. Page 11, uh, access fees um, have been uh, have been increased. Water and wastewater access fees have been increased by two percent. Um, we've added um, down toward uh, the bottom of the table that you see here up on the screen. And in that table, you'll see that we have added a planned development district line um, uh, for uh, uh, for access fees. And that's to update our, our current zoning. Um, and then the other comment that I guess I would make on the overall document is with regard to the charts themselves. Um, now this, I think, we're going to probably suggest another wrinkle for you here, um, and uh, we've we've kind of changed the format a little bit from the previous version in terms of the, the, the columns that were that were presented there, and put in uh, we uh, eliminated uh, the column original 2013-14 budget column, and we changed the wording uh, uh, percentage increase on the. On the far column to the right, we changed the wording to percentage increase from previous year, and we added a column uh, percentage of total revenue at the far end, and that's to give at the, I believe it was a Commissioner uh, Fioco's request to kind of help these numbers would give us an idea of what percentage of the total each line uh, represented. Um, I think um, to this to this uh, to this document that you see here, we might also recommend, and this isn't a big deal, but uh, we would recommend eliminating the word revise uh, and eliminating uh, the word recommended from the final documents, uh, just to kind of clean it up and hopefully eliminate any remaining confusion that we have in, in looking at this um, and try to make this as simple uh, and transparent of a document as we can. And uh, again, uh, this, uh, this this document uh, all along we've had up on uh, up on the website, uh, and also we've had available for public inspection in the lobby. And uh, more than happy to uh, take any other comments, recommendations, or uh, criticisms on this that you have. Uh, again, I think to, to echo what I said previously, I, I think this budget. Um, is, is a little bit more, um, uh, a little bit more easy to deal with than the, the previous budgets that we have. I think the results of this budget certainly, even with con, con, um, conservative uh, revenue estimates, uh, gets us into a pretty good shape. We're looking, of course, at a small general fund uh, appropriation, the smallest that we've had since I've been here. Uh, and I think again, with the conservative revenue estimates that we have for that, we, we will be in a, a positive position. I think. Um, in, in short order. Uh, and then obviously too with the rate adjustments that we've made, um, we'll be able to uh, balance our enterprise uh, operations uh, and, and I think sets us up for a pretty good uh, uh, position not only in this year uh, but in future years and uh, will certainly help us uh, with the LGC uh, as we move forward on, on some of these other projects that we're contemplating in the near future. So with that, I'd open this up. Uh, what we're asking, I guess, uh, tonight is if you uh, if you do uh, think that we're at the point that you would go ahead and uh, make a motion to approve uh, the resolution, and uh, this would uh, allow us to um, uh, this would allow us to have the final budget for the 2015-2016 year, uh, and uh, we'll get it out and operational. Thank you. Mr. Thank you. Questions from the board, comments, recommendations. Uh, I think it looks very good. I think it's what uh, we've all discussed and worked through. So um, I think with the just clerical corrections that we're discussing, I'd be happy to make a motion to approve. 
doing those interviews next week. Um, the, um, the, a position uh, to replace uh, Mr. Bass, um, the, the advertisement for that has been left. We're going to close the ads on that <coughs> on July 10th. Um, so, uh, spending a lot of time with, uh, with, with HR and recruitment right now at the moment. And uh, uh, it's, been, it's been interesting. It's part of the job I really enjoy. And I think we're going to come up with, uh, I think we're gonna come up with some, some new, good, new uh, additions to our team and really increase the uh, talent and experience we have to help uh, maintain the busy schedules that we're all uh, carrying right at the moment. Um, and uh, uh, aside from that, with, uh, with the approval of the budget this evening, uh, I think that gets us started on some things for the upcoming year. Um, the, uh, um, one of the one of the things I think that, that we'll be looking at is is sooner uh, probably than later um, is replacing. I don't know if you can see the projector down there, which uh, well makes for the projector down here, which I usually prop up with a combination of credit cards and cap lens and things of that nature. We're going to try to rework the AV system and not <coughs> provide. Uh, here, but also over there as well. Um, we mentioned this, I think, one of the previous budget sessions. So we'll be uh, working on some of that, and uh, again, hoping the uh, hoping the air conditioning uh, system holds up. Uh, if you were here at the planning board meeting last week, uh, we had uh, this half of the building, this half of the building that wasn't uh, that wasn't being air conditioned, and uh, unfortunately, that also affected this room, and we had some people here. Uh, in attendance uh, for the, the planning board meeting that we had scheduled for this past Wednesday. And, uh, you know, we're going to be, I guess, keeping that together. We did get it fixed. Uh, we're going to be keeping that together with probably um, whatever we can um, until we figure out a more permanent solution. So uh, the fun never stops. Uh, and uh, we're, we're looking forward to uh, keeping, keeping, these, uh, keeping these projects moving forward and, uh, and reporting out. Uh, fiscal year three, so which I would expect to be even more fun than the previous. So with that I would uh, open it up for any comments or concerns you guys have. Comments from the board? Concerns. Happy to see the park making good progress. Moving right along. Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Bruce. I have one thing about the park is Mr. Bruce that that we posted that on the uh, Facebook page and boy it's a lot of and today we've received $500 in donations. I wonder if that was my next question. How's the fundraising effort going? And so we've gotten three donations, so we're on 500 okay. Mr. Griesbeck, did you find out about yep. any sort can, of the... I'll connect, yeah, I'll connect with you. I see where you're going. Yeah, I got a response back. There's a, there's a community that... Uh, I, I don't know whether we discussed it during the meeting or just after. Uh, uh, the past meeting, but I think we talked about uh, crowd crowdfunding, like a Kickstarter or something like that, to help make up some of the difference. There's I'm still on the list serve uh, in in Michigan for the municipal list serve in Michigan, and there was a company that actually put together a crowdfunding application for communities in Michigan to do exactly this sort of thing to raise money for parks. And I got I did get a response directly from the developer of that app. So uh, let's see what see what we can do with it. Great. Thank you. Any additional comments? We'll go forward with mayor updates. I do not have anything from the EDC. <laughs> <laughs> Attend the meeting. So, what about RPF? Uh, the RPO um, actually uh, attended the most recent meeting, and there was some interesting news there that uh, Chatham Transit. Um, back in 2011 put in an application for a CMAC grant and to the DOT and the DOT at that time closed the program um, and I think they were the only application in in 2011. They recently opened up the project again so the DOT is funding that project and Chatham County um, has opted to follow through with their um, grant so the DOT is review or the application so they're reviewing it and if it is successful, it looks like it will fund two buses and its operation, those operations for a year. So that is something really quite unique to Chatham County in that the zone of this air quality issue is Orange County and Northern Chatham. 
and it reaches down to Pittsburgh. So a bus between Pittsburgh and Chapel Hill fits perfectly into that zone. And so it looks like um, at this point, you know, that, that it's not been granted yet, but they'll get two buses in a year's operation, so that's good news. Yeah. Thank you, Commissioner Pioca. Anything from Solid Waste? No, and I think I may have mentioned before that committee has disbanded. Oh, okay. That's Anything from the Fairground Association? Anything from the PBA downtown? Uh, yeah, there is a meeting tomorrow night at 7 o'clock at the Roadhouse um, where there will be a presentation by the NCDOT on progress for the improvements to the circle and a general discussion about the downtown vision plan. So please, everybody, come out. Anything okay. additional? All right, thank you so much. Uh, we can go forward with Commissioner Concerns. Commissioner Farrah, do you have any um, Just one thing that's been brought to my attention about our, maybe our sign ordinance. Uh, Mr. Bruce Beck may want to check around. I know we've had, a, I have had several calls regarding some banners that have been putting up around. Sure, you see seen our local car wash it, you know, downtown, and I've seen a few. Uh, Around some businesses in town, I don't know how they're respecting on the sign more than uh, several people. It's, it's getting a little tacky. Well, part of the thing we can verify exactly where that fits in. Uh, I, I won't comment on, on, on the chapter and verse of the site just just yet, although I will assume that the signs are probably a little bit beyond what we do allow. Uh, it, it, it does help to have a commitment from the board as we start making these. As we start making these uh, notifications, uh, mm -hmm. because people are very passionate about their additional signage, uh, and so just uh, just so you guys are prepared, if if we start following forward with um, notifications to that effect regarding these signs, that, that um, we will try to keep them informed on exactly what our site ordinance is, so you can have those discussions with people as they bring them up to you, because having that commitment from you guys is is critical. And we're not going to share that commitment. Um, that's not the new That's not a battle that we're going to fight unless we're all committed to fight. So, yeah. And I had one other. I've had several uh, comments regarding the golf carts and uh, what what is our stand on the golf carts. So uh, just maybe keep that in. Uh, that's actually one I'm looking into. I've got a couple of other cities' ordinances. And uh, I'll probably just be crazy busy with the budget and other stuff I had going on, some personnel issues. But I've uh, got some other city's ordinance, and I'm going to actually shoot some stuff off, uh, try to tweak it in Pittsburgh, and probably shoot some stuff off in the next couple of weeks to Mr. Messick and uh, get his input on it. I spoke with the, uh, is it Ms. Mann? She was just here. Yeah. The one that brought it up, I spoke to her at the beginning of the meeting, and I let her know it. It was still on my on my stove. It was just on back burner right now, and that uh, we would try to come up with something for y'all to look through it, see if y'all want to look into it further. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Okay. Well, I don't have anything other than I thank Ms. Inslee as usual for this. I really do appreciate this information in reference to financial reporting that's very important to us. And in reference to the sign ordinance, I do support what Commissioner Farrell was also saying in reference to that. So we have my support on that. And I'm sure to support too. So if there is nothing else, we need a motion to adjourn. So this all in favor. Aye. Aye. Thank you.